So this is 1 John 5. Uh, and um, Right, well, we'll just see where it goes. And um, it, it's, it's going to be kind of a summary. I'm going to be dotting around all of 1 John. Uh, but I won't need to. Uh, just go with me and we'll bear with me. We'll see where we go. And um, anyway, the first thing I want to mention is about 1 John and how, how it differs from uh, the letters of Paul, for instance. Now, the New Testament letters are predominantly Paul's letters. I say predominantly Paul's letters. There's, uh, I've worked it out, 12 out of 22 of the letters, but a lot of the letters are very small. Paul's are very bulky, and so you'll find that the a large content of uh, the letters in the New Testament between Acts and Revelation uh, are Pauline in origin. Our Methodist church is a Protestant church, and it's um, rooted, if you go far back enough, in what's called the Reformation, where uh, a man by the name of Luther or people of his <laughs> ilk um, uh, remonstrated against the payments that were demanded by the church at the time and said, look, God must be, uh, God's love is free. You shouldn't have to pay for it. Uh, and, uh, and there was corruption all around. And uh, Luther rediscovered, basically, and reinstituted uh, how important Paul's doctrines were and his message of grace uh, as the foundation of our uh, position in God and our uh, and our eternal uh, status. Now, <clears throat> but the con. So uh, basically, if you look at the uh, hymns in the Methodist Church and in our Protestant tradition, a lot of them are built around Paul's letters and what we learn there. Uh, especially like in Christ alone, you can just see all the sacrificial language that Christ paid the price for our sin, etc., uh, etc. Et it's all there, and I'm not saying that it isn't in in John or James or the others, but it you can see how central Paul's uh, theology is to many of the hymns that we sing. The content of John's letters have a different flavour. Uh, as we've already, a, a different emphasis, should I say. Now, the first chapter is definitely centred on forgiveness, and there are passages in John that seem, uh, uh, there are passages in John that seem to impose upon us uh, expectations that we're not familiar with. So what I'm saying is uh, that there's something in John uh, that seems to, uh, yeah, impose upon us expectations that we're not familiar with. For example, in the passages we've just read, whoever abides in him does not sin. Uh, whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, it says, two times. Uh, the uh, NIV has tried to soften the blow by putting the word habitually sin, but it's not there. <laughs> uh, it's a justifiable addition and, uh, but it isn't there. The translators of the NIV have taken away the shock and the jolt of the immediacy of the text. And sometimes I think it's a bit sad. Sometimes we need to leave things as they are and just let them hit us and go, oh, yeah, what am I going to do with that experience? And how am I going to reconcile this with, with the love of God? And it's a, great, it's a great thing. You spend more time in prayer thinking, oh, God, help me. <laughs> uh, it's a good thing. Anyway, that's another story. But uh, in, uh, interestingly, grace, the word grace, is nowhere mentioned in uh, the epistles of John. You won't find it. You'll only find it once in the gospel of John. Grace and truth comes through Jesus Christ. But the word love, uh, grace means unmerited love, whereas uh, the, the love that seems to be implied here is what, what is traditionally called the love of complacency. Uh, but not in a bad way, complacent. You know, he's very complacent. It's uh, a love of uh, that hasn't got this uh, unmerited aspect to it. And now um, that, as I think uh, Diane said last time, is 27 times 
which is a large proportion of the usage of the word love in this particular letter. Now, it seems to me that plan A and plan B, you'll find out what they are, have been interchanged. Plan A is the one we're familiar with. Uh, you've, you've got, you have grace, aim for perfect love. You're not going to get there, but, you know, do your best. Uh, and, and uh, d you know, you're forgiven anyway, so it, it, it's all right. It's all accounted for. Plan B, which we see in John, is uh, the, the perfection of God's love is expected of us. But if we fail, it's, it, grace is there, if we fail. And this is the word that's different in John. Our, I say our interpretation of Paul is such that we will never be perfect. When we sin, we will be forgiven. It's an expected thing because we, we're not perfect when we sin. But in the words of John, it's quite different. He said, if we sin, sin is not something we expect to do. Sin is the thing that we're not, that, that, that is the extraordinary thing. So it's quite a challenge. What I'm trying to say is, this is hairy stuff. Uh, and uh, to, to blunt the challenge of it is, 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 uh, is not a... You know, it's, it's all right not to blunt the challenge of it. He says, if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father who is Jesus Christ, the righteous. So given such high expectations, we need, to, we need help this morning in breaking down some of the theological and practical limitations we place upon ourselves. You know, this kind of thing, oh, I can't do it. Oh, no, I can't do it. I'm a sinner, I can't achieve it. We want to break some of these things down in order to, uh, to be able to take in what John is saying in his epistle. I'll be using, wherever possible, 1 John to do this. But then at the end, we'll be looking at the text and hopefully we'll look at it with fresh expectations, with an anticipation that if Christ dwells in us, then nothing is impossible. There are two passages in Scripture similar that say, with Without Jesus, I can do, we can do nothing. And then the other one is, with him, we can do all things. And it's the second emphasis. Neither are wrong, but it's just a different emphasis that perhaps we're not as familiar with because of the theology that has undergirded our tradition. But it's an exciting challenge because of who Jesus is. Okay, now... Uh, People say, uh, guess what? what, who's just retired, where is she, Andrea? Where, what's the most common phrase people have said to you, Christians especially? You never, no, you haven't had it. Oh, I've, you, you never retire in God's work. <laughs> You've had that one. Oh, sister, you're never retiring. Oh, well, you watch me. <laughs> um, well, I've been spending my time... Uh, Having a good time with PowerPoint. <laughs> so, um, okay. And we are thinking about this business of how we relate our working for God with God. Okay, so the first aspect I've got here is legalism. Uh, that is just doing what you know should be right. Uh, I've used the word legalism. Maybe I shouldn't have done. I should have just put something like cold obedience. It's in the Bible. Get it done, lad in the Yorkshire accent, you know. Um, and uh, there is a lot of mileage for that. There's the old story I've, I'm sure I've told you. I've so heard my old illustration so much, I think everybody's heard them. But the old illustration, a guy called Dr. Crane, this lady wanted to get, get back on her husband. She, she said, I really want to upset him. I, I, want, I really want to really hurt him. She, he said, well, he said, look, this is the best way, he says. You go home and treat him with all the love you've got. Serve him and give him good meals. and you know, do, Bend over backwards to be the best wife you can. Then after a month, drop the bomb, she said. Tell him you're leaving. And uh, that will really upset him. And she went out. Oh, so great. She's, yeah, as you all know how that feels. And um, anyway, what happened after that was, after a month, Dr. Crane thought, well, she hasn't got back to me. And she said, well, I did everything you told me, but I've discovered that I do love him <laughs> by the actions. So basically, she, she went through the motions of doing what she should be doing. And actually what happened, it brought up like, uh, like 
the love that was there. So let's not knock it. The, you know, sometimes that's all we've got. I just know I've got to do that and I'm going to do it. But of course, it has its limitations. First of all, as it implies, it can be like a good work. It's something we have selfish motives in terms of maybe our future reward or, we, we, or it could have fearful motives that I'm afraid that if I don't do this, I will be punished by God. And so all these motivations can kick in if that on its own is the way that we do our service for God. And I think that God wouldn't want it like that. God does not want cold obedience or to motivate us with fear. God wants more than that. Let's have a look at another one. Here we are. Oh, that's it. Yeah, there we are. Bit of one, John. Um, this is the command. And we see this a lot. Just, you know, do as you're told. Do his commandment. End of. Um, the next one is reciprocation, where we get, we love him because he first loved us. And we sing that a lot. And it's obviously, it's correct. We love him because he first loved us. We reciprocate the love that Jesus has given to us. What's wrong with that? Nothing's wrong with any of them. What I'm trying to say is nothing wrong with them. But I say they, are fr they have their downfall sometimes when taken on their own. It's better than the first, this one. It's a response to love. Uh, but on its own, it's another version of one. And uh, it's implied. Uh, one John says somewhere, we ought to love one another. An oughtness. Now, when I see the word ought, it means I don't really want to do it. <laughs> we ought really to do it. Um, there's a reluctance implied. And um, the idea of... Um, of this, reciprocation could be just, uh, well, I ought to do it because he's done that for me. A little bit like the Christmas card syndrome in, when we did Christmas card. Oh, I've got to send them a card. They sent one to me last year. Oh, I better love Jesus because he's loved me so much. Do you know what I mean? Uh, and a bit like a catalogue. You get someone through the post. You think, whoa, great. And then you get a bill about a month later. Oh, I've got to pay for it. And so Christianity for a lot of people can be, ah, oh, Jesus, is, I've got to pay him back. Now, if I was God, I wouldn't want to be, I wouldn't want that kind of relationship. I love my children, uh, not because for what, I, I mean, some of us go, uh, yeah, after all we've done for them and all that, but I don't. I, I love them because I love them. It's not what I can get out of them that I love them for. And, God, and surely that's a limitation, isn't it, reciprocation, if that's all it is, that God is loving getting from me uh, something that he wants by co co manipulating me with love. That is not. So I'm not saying this is wrong. Again, don't get me wrong. We love him because he first loved us. But I'm saying on its own, it can break down into something like that. There is another one. Uh, I've called this one participation or union with God. And this is the one for me which come, is most intuitively correct. You cannot command love. I know it says this is the greatest commandment to love others, but it it can't just mean that. You cannot command someone to love you. It just isn't. And neither would God just command, you've got to love me, you know. I'm, you know, my intuition says, no, there's something more to it. Neither can you manipulate somebody to love you. It must come from a heart-to-heart -heart relationship. And this is where the union and participation comes in. A genuine relational love because of its quality. Because it's your very nature. Love is not a quantitative thing which we can barter with. It's not a currency that we can gain things by. It's a qualitative thing where we have a mutual relationship. And this is what God came to set. This is what he came to establish. Uh, God is love. And we were created in God's likeness. So when God made us, he made us like himself. But because of what we call the fall, uh, oh, yeah, there's, my part, there's my participation one. Because of the fall, we marred that image. The image was marred. We became self-centered, unloving, and all the rest of it. But Jesus came, and when he died on the cross, he came to reinstitute, to, to correct that, to bring back God's image in us. Uh, not just that we should reflect it, but that we should be. This is what we are. And there's a, a portion in the Bible in Peter that we are partakers 
of the divine nature. So redeemed man, as someone has said, God has so redeemed mankind, humankind, as we say today, God has so redeemed humankind that if an elevated human, redeemed humankind, that were he to elevate humankind anymore, he would be breaching the Godhead. This is what it is. This, you might look at me and say, Eek. I look at you and say, nah. But each one of us is made in the image and reborn into the image of God, as he says, partakers of eternal life. And as much as it can be said that God is love, if we want our essential identity, if we're made in God's image, we are love. <laughs> Who am I? I'm love. It probably won't go down well out there. But that is our right. If that's God's identity, that's ours. Because we are made and recreated in the image of God. And you can't be any more than who you are. You know, I, I can't tell you, Paul, to be Paul. <laughs> this is not something to calculate. Because it's what you are as a Christian. And uh, this is an encouragement that we are the children of God. And, and um, he, he's, hang on, it's, yes, it's who we are. And you find uh, in 1 John 3, he says it like this to John. He says, now are you the sons of God. I think this is another jolt he's trying to kick into. Now are you the sons of God. Not, you've got to work yourselves up to be what a son of God is. He's saying, now are you the sons of God. It does not yet appear what you shall be, but you shall be like him when you see him as he is. So when we know who we are, then the scriptures that we may find daunting, daunting in 1 John aren't quite so daunting. We see a great potential. And this is what prayer is about, I think. Prayer is, uh, is about repentance and what I call, or what the Bible calls, kenosis, a letting go, so that you're re-establishing yourself in that union with God so that everything, the reciprocal work and the obedient work at the top all fall into place, that we keep his commandments because we love him. We respond to his love because he's, we are born again of that love in our hearts. And so that is the first thing, really, that I want to say is that uh, we have eternal life. And this life is in his son. And um, we're going to move that. We'll get that for PowerPoint, David. <laughs> A little slip to the right there. And uh, on we go. Uh, so... But if we are made in the image of God, we've got to ask ourselves, well, who is this God in whom we're made an image of? It makes sense, doesn't it? If you're going to know who you are and you say, well, you're like him. Yeah, but what's he like? Have you ever heard someone say, oh, Bruce, be yourself? Yeah, I'm going for an interview. Be yourself. Yeah, but who am I? <laughs> Which self do you want? The idiot? <laughs> or, the, or the nice self? Or the nasty self? You know, who, who am I? Yeah, it's, but you're in the image. You're, yeah, but who's God? So let's have a quick look at that. Okay, well, this is something I've made up myself. Um, but it's come from prayer. Uh, <laughs> the, I didn't make this up. The Father... Uh, but the way I see it is this, the fa that you've got the Father, you've got the Son, and you've got the Holy Spirit. Now, it says, let us make man in our image. So we, have, we are tripartite beings. We have, we're made in the image of the Trinity God, which makes it even more complicated, thankfully. Uh, but, yeah, there we go. And, uh, yeah, the Son, we have the symbol of the cross. And for the spirit, we may have a symbol of a dove or fire. But funnily enough, uh, for the father, there is no symbol. We have no symbol for the father. And the way I see God, that the God is pure potential. God the father is pure potential. Perfect goodness and intentional, but there's nowhere for it to go. <laughs> Just pure on, on his own. If, if 
the father was on his own, which he never was, so don't worry about it. But if we were to isolate that aspect of the Godhead, that pure potential of perfect goodness, there's no symbol for it because Jesus says about the father, no man, what does he say? No one has ever seen God. No one has ever seen the father. The father is that aspect of the God the Godhead, which we would call apophatic, which means consists of that what we don't know. So if you say, what do you think God's like, Laura? I think he's, yeah, well, your concept of greatness is so limited because, well, he's not great then. No, he's, yeah, that's wrong as all. Well. So basically God is bigger than our concepts. And so we, we call this the apophatic. The unmanifest, some would call it, the infinite, the transcendent, the non-linear uh, the non-dual experience, you know, the whole host of spiritual experiences uh, uh, that come under, th under that title. Um, and it fits with, um, yeah, the, the formlessness of creation. It says uh, the, uh, the word is tohu wa bohu. It sounds like a vegetarian meal, but it means formless and void. Uh, and it's that aspect of the Godhead that registers with that formlessness and void, that lack of tangibility, we just cannot comprehend this aspect of the Godhead. Now the Son is quite different. The Son is the form of God. And Jesus said, but the, but the Son is the one uh, is, who has made the Father known. And so we have the unknown aspect, which is they call the apophatic, the other one is the cataphatic, everything we do know about God, which is Jesus. People like to make a distinction in religions and say, oh, you know, but we've got them both. <laughs> we've got both the unknown and the known of God, and they're held together as one. It's quite amazing, really. And it says the Son has revealed him, and this is the logos of God, or the idea of God. So we have, now we're getting somewhere. God wanted, uh, if God wants to reveal him, Self, he does it through the sun. And if we could isolate the situation, God was like, I've got all these brilliant ideas, but I don't know how to get them out there. And he said, who can I trust with them? It, obviously, this conversation wouldn't ha be had because they were always together. But the sun is the one who's been entrusted with the uh, revelation that's in the heart of the Father, that's unknown until the sun brings form and shape to it. And then we see the spirit who is the one who brings actualization. You will receive the spirit of power. And, and it's the spirit that brings it into reality, the executor of the Godhead. And so we see the Father, the unknown, the Son who brings form, and the Spirit who brings the execution of the reality of God in the created order. And uh, we see this, we do see it, as, as I've said, in creation. We see, let us make man in our own image. The father says, hey, I've got this here. And the son says, yeah, I know what it is. I've got it here. I've got it. I've got it. And then the spirit's brooding on the face of the waters. And God speaks, right, let, let it go. Let there be. And things were created. You see it in, uh, in redemption, in God's love. You see God's loving heart. But how is it going to be shared How's it going to be declared? And Jesus comes into the earth, the word made flesh. And so, so that love which God has for his fallen people has now got form. And on the cross, you see it as Jesus died. And then on the day of Pentecost, it is confirmed, the reality of it. So today we celebrate the reality of that presence. Uh, and then... I'm sorry if I get excited, by the way. I feel like that lady on Gardener's World. <laughs> oh, the, the tulips are so beautiful. <laughs> Have you seen her? Yeah, and that sometimes irritates me. So if my enthusiasm irritates you, I'm so sorry, but it's one of those sermons. Um, everyday life we see it in creativity. It's just... It, think about how you operate being made in the image of God. You've got some, a musician, you're writing a song, you've got something down here, or an author, or anything you create. It's, and then your brain goes, hey, what's going on here? 
down here. And the brain picks it up and starts to give form to it. And then you execute it. I've been taking up uh, whittling in my retirement with bits of wood. And it, uh, it, well, my intention was a dog. It's, then I moved the goalposts, actually. Then it was a cat. Then it was a fox. But I've worked out now it, it's, a, it's a meerkat. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in, in fact, that's somehow how creation, the creative work of God operates and how it works. It's a stripping away in order to discover what's really there. Uh, it was Michelangelo, he said, the statue was already in there. It's my job just to release it. And God has placed things in our lives. And our job is to discover what they are. And through, through all our faculties to, and then find that we've now got the idea of it here. Now, how is it going to be implemented? And God's in all that. And that's what it is to be made and redeemed and in the image of God. Uh, and so uh, when we take the two together, it's a great thing. We've got this uh, tripartite trinity God working potential form and actually operating within our, our humanity. And we have that union with God in order to execute what God has placed upon our hearts. It's a wonderful thing. And so those two, the, the reason that you say, hang on, where's one John in all this? What I'm trying to say is what we are, who we are, and who we're working with will raise our expectations in order to embrace some of these commands in Scripture so that we won't be saying, oh, you know, how, how can I love the way Jesus loves? We'll come out of it saying, how can't I love the way Jesus loves? Which is a nice thing, isn't it? Another thing, the power of fellowship. Now, I don't know if anybody's reading it. A book's just come out called uh, uh, The Overstory, Understory. <laughs> Where's it go? I'm reading it. I forgot what it's called. The Overstory by Richard Powers, and it's about people and trees, and uh, the trees bring them together. I'm going all hippie in my old age. I'm loving it. But anyway, this thing here, this Douglas fir is amazing. The lateral roots of the two Douglas firs run into each other underground, and they fuse. And through those self-grafted knots, the two trees join their vascular systems together and become one. That is amazing. And it's so Christian. It's so, <laughs> the trees are Christians. Um, and we are to be rooted and established, rooted in love. Can you see that? Can you see how perhaps to evangelize what you're doing, you're kind of planting trees. And then when people become Christians you're going to now sort of look out underneath and find the roots and so you can join together. So, so when we come to church, uh, we may, you know, we have conversations, we have a bit of a laugh, say, how are you? Ross on guitar, nice camera, all the rest. You know, we have all these little conversations, things, worship, all these things, but underneath something bigger is going on. And what we're doing, we're strengthening that underground root system. We're connecting with one another in stronger ways so that we can be stronger in the love of God. It's happening all the time. When Joyce blessed the heart, my Carol can't get to church, anxiety problems and the rest, but Joyce, you bless you, you come to our church, come to our home, and what, what you're doing is strengthening the root system there so she can continually draw from this vascular system that uh, we talk about here so whenever we visit somebody whenever we pray for somebody in fact in everything we're doing christianly we're strengthening that underground system and making our connectivity with the vascular center the heart throb of god stronger and stronger and this root system is 100% Jesus Christ love. It's not, you know, like, oh, we are the 11 o'clock root system and the 9.30's gone home. Or it's not we're a Methodist root system. It's not that we're Burniston and Church root system. It's not, that's not the root system we're here to establish. It's not the CTIS root system or Scarborough Church's root system or the Methodist root. 
it's we the root system that is being strengthened is 100 percent jesus christ because he is our fort he is our strength he's everything that we need we're connected i mean we talk about facebook and uh, twitter we've been doing it for ages <laughs> But we're just largely unconscious of it. And you don't really need to be conscious of it. It's just happening. I'm here now and I, in theory, are strengthening your root system. And you are strengthening my root You know, we're all, this is great. If you could have x-ray spiritual eyes, you'd see this complex strength going on underneath us all. And that's quite exciting. That also is very stimulating when, we, when we're reading what, what is expected of us because we've got one another as well we've got God we're, we're, we've got eternal life we've got we're co-laborers with God collaborators with God if you like and we've got one another wow it's amazing they're beautiful <laughs> anyway let's have a quick now I've built you up a little bit I don't know you never know but this is my intention we're going to look at the passage again and we're going to, instead of going, oh, man, I don't know about that. I we're going to say, you know, who is, where are the limitations in this of who God, what God has made us? So, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves the Father from his heart loves his child as well. This is how we know we love the children of God. By loving God and carrying out his commands. You see, those three things come into line. Don't so we carry out his commands because of the love we have. For everyone of God, born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. I'm probably referring to the uh, baptism and the death of Jesus. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies, because <laughs> the Spirit is truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And the three are in agreement. Don't ask me what that means. Could be referring to the Trinity, but actually that was only, uh, that was only introduced to the Scriptures after the 14th century, that's one little passage out of the rest of the New Testament that, that possibly shouldn't be there, but it's doing no harm. <laughs> um, that one. Uh, if you look it up, you'll find that uh, you'll find at the bottom of your Bible, this was introduced in the 14th century. Anyway, we accept human testimony, but God's testimony in our hearts is greater because it's the testimony of God, which is given about his son. Whoever believes in the Son of God accepts this testimony. And whoever does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because they've not believed in the testimony God has given about his Son. And this is the testimony. God has given to us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Now I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence we have it in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And we know that he hears us. Whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. Prayer. What confidence we should have, really, in prayer. And I, I'm not a great prayer. I, I don't know. How, I, I think we're all the same. <laughs> we're well out of our depths. But Carol and I say a little prayer together at night, and if there's needs that have come over, over the day, we bring them to God. And uh, I, can, I can say that there are three people I know who've had cancer, and who have been, been um, not but through the doctors, but have got better. And I, I, I just can't help attributing it just to the simple, oh, I'm just saying this, Lord, just praying it, just faithfully. Uh, so, you know, yeah. that's an encouragement for me um, there are other prayers that I'm still waiting on but the thing is in prayer we're open to the possibility of the impossible when, we're, when our hearts are filled with God we don't, we, no, we break, all these limitations go by and we hold ourselves up before the possibility 
of what God can do. And the little thoughts come across, well, not that, not that, hang on. I'm not going to rationalise this at all. I'm in the presence of one who is beyond my rational understanding. This is a bit of an ap apophatic exercise, this. I'm putting it all to one side and embracing the possibility that my little prayers are going to be answered in some way that I would never have begun to rationalise. Anyway, then we get to a bit of a difficult bit, which I've no idea what it means, uh, and neither has anybody else if you do a research on it. It just says, if a brother or sister sin does not lead to death, you should pray, God will give them life. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death, and I'm not saying that you should pray about that. I'm sure one or two of you have got an answer to that, but seriously, they're, they're so vague and varied. Um, but the thing is, they, they're there to sort of, oh, what? And then you fall back into, oh, you've got an answer. What? Am I in the wrong place? That's it. YouTube are going to miss out now, aren't they? Um, all wrongdoing is sin, and there is a sin that does not leave us. We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. There, yeah, yeah, continue to sin. Actually, d does not sin. One who has been born of God keeps them one. The one who was born of God keeps them safe, and the evil one cannot harm them. We know that we are the children of God. We know, and the whole world is under the control of the evil one. We know also that the Son of God has come and given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true by being in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. I think he'd given up then. I think he was going to start something else and he thought, I'll give it a rest. Uh, so, that's just another thought. It's not contradictory at all uh, to other approaches. But sometimes it's good, instead of mourning what you haven't got, is to celebrate what you really do have and taking it on board in your life and getting on with it. Um, it's a pastoral epistle. Uh, it's almost could be seen as defensive and protectionist. It'll keep us from the world, you know. Oh, we're safe, we're all right. The world is kind of alien. Uh, but we have to read it in the context of the whole of Scripture. Jesus said that God so loved the world that he gave his son. Uh, we're in the world, but not of it. And when I was a hippie, I was of the world, but not in it. <laughs> and, um, but the love to which we're called uh, is a boundless love. It doesn't know any boundaries. And there is a form of love which you could actually sociologically calculate how it develops in societies that people in order to keep the society going develop this kind of respect for elders and uh, don't steal don't do that and I guess there must be some atheistic kind of sociologists who said look morals can develop yeah they develop within a closed system but anybody that steps out of that closed system suddenly can become alienated and it often happens in religions, happens in denominations, happens in lots of things. They're no longer part of us. Uh, someone has argued that it ha even countries, this is why we have wars, you know, they're not part of us. And uh, even some country, countries that have policies that seem to, you know, ha to be respectful of other cultures, you know, when the rubber meets the road, it, it's lacking. And I, I, it's a closed system of a limited love. But the love of God has no boundaries. In fact, it says in the scripture, we love because God so loved us. In the Bible, they've put it, we love him because he so loved us. But actually, that him is not there. It's we love. We just love. There's no compromise. <laughs> there are no, there's nothing before us that we can say, oh, we now have to put this boundary up against uh, against oh, I'm not talking in big social ways how to come with the NHS and all the rest of it but I'm talking about our individual personal relationships there are no limits uh, to the love which God has placed in our hearts it's an open system rather than a closed system finally 
somebody once said, I was in the dentist's waiting room, I heard him on the radio, they said this, the church is the only institution that works primarily for the benefit of non-members. <laughs> Most institutions exist for their own benefit, but the church exists for the benefit of the don't belong to it, which is quite interesting, isn't it? It gives you that kind of reaching out idea. The final thing is I just want to say that perhaps in your own experience, you say, yeah, I, my Christian experience um, is, uh, I know about, you know, trying to do my best to be a good Christian, and I really do try hard to get it right. You may be somebody that says, yes, I understand, and I, I am really trying to serve Jesus, but actually this middle bit in your own life is, is missing. You feel two things. You feel that you don't know the the presence of Jesus Christ in your life. You know all the trappings and the trimmings of Christian behaviour and you're doing a fantastic job and I, I salute you for it. But you really want to seal the deal and say, I want to know Jesus Christ in the centre of my life, in my heart. Don't go away without talking. Don't be ashamed of it. It's nothing to be sh ashamed about. And it might be something you feel weak about at this particular time. It's something that we can pray with you for. The other thing is, you come to church, but somehow you don't feel you belong. Intuitively, you know, somehow you're not part of the root system. Uh, it's something you intuit, or if you're not sure about. Again, this is why we're here, to strengthen that connection and to build the, your aspect of that root system, so that you could be rooted and grounded in love. And uh, so those two things, really, I finish with just... You know, please, if there's any questions, if there's anything you want to pray about, that's we have a prayer team and we're just so happy and delighted to try and help you. Amen.